1950, Alan Turing introduced a test that was the most provocative test that the world had seen at that time. Alan Turing was an English mathematician, a computer scientist, and a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence. And Turing actually served in World War II. He served the Allied cause by breaking the code known as the Enigma Code, which Nazi Germany used to communicate during the war. Now, Turing was a brilliant man, and among many of his contributions to society, he is credited with something known as the Turing Test. The Turing test is a test that is designed to determine whether or not a machine can be called intelligent. And the way that this test works is that it is designed to have a human evaluator who is told that they will communicate with two people only through text on a computer screen. They know that one person is an actual person and the other person is a computer. And the evaluator has to decide which is the human and which is the computer. And if the machine passed the test and gets chosen as the human, it is shown to be intelligent. And just so that you know, the computer almost always succeeds. Now, you may have been subject to your own Turing-like test. Research shows that 80% of us have interacted with AI chatbots. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. For example, did I use AI to write this sermon today? <laughs> will you ever know? I think you probably will, because if I had used AI to write a sermon about technology, it's probably going to be better than the one that you're going to hear that I wrote today. But I did use AI to write the caption for social media to promote this sermon just to see what it would say about itself and technology, and I found it to be quite fascinating. So technology is a part of our everyday life. It's growing increasingly so in 2023. So how does our faith intersect with technology? When we are wrapping up this series today called Spheres, where we have been talking about how our faith interacts with all the circles in our life that we live in. And today we're gonna talk about the intersection of faith and technology. So where do we start? Let's start here. What do we mean when we say technology? Because I think it's tempting to think of technology as electronic gadgets, but the roots of technology have actually been around since the beginning of time, and they've always shaped how we view the world. Now, the English term technology is composed of two Greek words, techni, which means craft, skill, or art, and logia, which refers to the systematic study of a subject. Now, when we say someone is doing technology or is an into technology, we think about how much they like their devices. But when the Greeks called someone a tech tone, it meant that that person had spent time learning and honing a craft that involved a tool. And that could be wood, stone, metal. One time, technology meant a shovel or a hammer. And in Matthew 13, 55, Jesus is teaching in the synagogue in his hometown, and this is what the people say. They say, isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And here's what's interesting, is the word that's translated carpenter here in the Greek is the word tech tone which meant an artisan or a skilled worker. So carpentry involved tools that transforms the wood into something useful. And so Joseph's profession, which was likely taught to Jesus as a young boy, fits into the earliest definitions of using technology. Now, it wasn't until much later, that's in the 1600s, that the term technology shifted into our English dictionary and our vocabulary, and it changed the meaning. It moved away from the way that the Greeks had used the word to the way that we understand it now uh, to talk about scientific exploration, and it really happened through the invention of large-scale machinery. So when we talk about technology, we have to talk about all the tools that we use daily. Light bulbs, cars, air conditioning, phones, internet, microwaves, all of those things have been invented in the last 150 years. Now there is a book that I am relying heavily on for this sermon, so if you're interested in this topic, I suggest that you can read it for more information, but the book is called From the Garden to the City, The Place of Technology and the Story of God. 
And John Dyer points out this about technology. He says that it has changed our world so drastically that the biblical Abraham of 2,000 years ago would have more in common with Abraham Lincoln than Lincoln has in common with us in the 21st century. Biblical Abraham's father raised cattle, and I don't know if you know this or not because I just learned it, Abraham Lincoln's father raised pumpkins and corn. Most of us, though, spend our time indoors with electronics at a desk with very little knowledge of farming. Abraham of biblical times and Abraham Lincoln, they would have written letters and communicated mostly in person. We today write electronically and communicate through devices. And Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, once grouped how we view technology into three categories. See if these views resonate with you. The first view is that we view everything already in the world when you are born as normal. The second view is that anything invented between then and when you turn 30 is incredibly exciting and creative, and with any luck, you might make a career out of it. And the last view is that anything invented after you are 30 is against the natural order of things and the beginning of the end of civilization as we know it. <laughs> there are definitely generational gaps when it comes to how we view technology. And I think we can all say that we understand that technology can be good and it can be used for good, but technology can be bad and it can be used for bad. For example, technology has been used for incredible things in medicine. We have actually doubled our lifespan in the last century due to advancements in medicine through technology. Technology has given platforms for the gospel to be shared in places that it has never been before, for translations, for missionaries, for biblical Bibles, for content of Bible studies. There's been amazing ways that technology has been used for good. But then there's also the bad ways that technology has. We have the dark web, we have affairs through social media, we have addictions to screens, and some would say that technology is leading to the downfall of society and the lack of family values. John Dyer says this in his book. Theologically speaking, technology is a God-given good. By saying technology is good, I don't mean that every use of technology is good, nor do I mean that every individual tool or device is good. What I mean is that God created humans to bear his image, and one, of this, one aspect of this is our creative capacity, which includes making and using technology. It's true that any technology can be used for good or for evil, but its fundamental nature is tied back to the image-bearing humanity, which God has declared as good. So the problem arises with technology when we just assimilate it and we just use it without really taking time to examine it or question it. So when technology has distracted us to the point where we will no longer stop and examine it, it has the ability to enslave us. So here's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about two practical principles that I think are helpful and important for us when we are talking about faith and technology. And the first is this. Be aware of the way technology is shaping you. So for years, one line of thought has been that technology is morally neutral, that technology is a tool that is neutral, and the way that it is used can be determined whether or not that technology is morally good or morally bad. But that line of thinking has shifted over the last decades because we have come to understand that just using technology has the ability to influence us and shape us. Just the use of technology has the ability to change us. And one way technology does that is through something called curation. We live in a perfectly curated digital world. For example, if you were to open up your social media feed, whether that's Instagram or uh, TikTok or Facebook or X, Twitter, whatever it's called these days, if you were to open that up and look at your feed, your feed would most likely be very different from my feed because there is digital content that is created and purposed for us. 
And it's not just on social media, it's our TV news channels, it's also the platforms that we stream movies or television. For example, nothing drives me more crazy than when someone watches shows that I would never watch in Netflix underneath my profile. And then I'm getting recommendations for all sorts of things I would never watch. My father-in-law loves Westerns. He comes in town to visit. He watches my Netflix. And for weeks after, all I'm getting recommended is the latest, greatest Western of the day. And when my husband wants to drive me a little crazy, he will open up my TikTok and he will say to it things like comedians and musicians and politicians and topics that I would never want in my TikTok feed because he knows that I have perfectly curated it to serve me up only cute animals, food, fashion, Alabama football, and Taylor Swift. That's it. That's all I wanna see in my TikTok feed. But we have, companies have thousands of pieces of content that they could choose to show you. And instead, what they do is they design the content that they show you just exactly for you. And how do they do this? Well, through thousands of data points that they are collecting about you, and the way that you are engaging, the things that you are watching, what you are clicking on, what you are commenting on, tells them what is going to keep you engaged on their platform the longest or keep them tuned in to their channel the longest. And they have powerful algorithms. TikTok, YouTube are two of the most powerful recommendation engines to keep you connected. And while this can make technology much more enjoyable for us, there is a downside and danger to curation because you are only being exposed to one viewpoint, one side of an argument, one piece of content that caters to you over and over again. And when it does that, it filters out anything that might challenge you that might stretch you, that might have you engaged with a different viewpoint. And when that happens, you can find yourself living in an echo chamber. And an echo chamber is when you only interact with information that supports your own opinions, that supports your own viewpoint. And when that happens, our worldview starts to get really narrow and our focus starts to turn inward. When we see only what we wanna see, when we see only what we agree with and what we believe, well, curation can make us the center of our world. And when that happens, we are less likely to be outwardly focused. We are less likely to be empathetic or understanding or to engage another viewpoint. And that can make us less likely to have meaningful, respectful, grace-filled discourse with people who disagree or don't believe like us or have different experiences than us. And what it does is it can push us into tribes and silos, and that is contrary to the way of Jesus and the command to love our neighbors. Who are our neighbors? Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Luke that everyone is our neighbors, which means that the people that you're forming opinions about, the people that you are engaging with, the things that you are reading, the opinions you are being informed, the people that you may sometimes rant about, well, those are all your neighbors, and we're called to engage them and understand them and try to be empathetic about their worldview as well. So here's what I want you to do. The next time you open up your social media app or you tell Alexa that you want the news of the day or you turn into your favorite news channel, I want you to remember that what you are seeing and hearing is picked purposely for you to shape you and your world view. So be aware of the way that just using technology has the ability to shape you. The other way, in addition to shaping our worldview, that technology can shape us is that it can shape our identity. When we are online, we have a choice of how to present ourselves. We have a choice of what information to share about ourselves, and the tendency can be that we want to share ourselves in a certain way. And that doesn't happen to people who are just trying to have a following. It happens to any of us when we're thinking about what to share online. There's a professor named Jacob Schatzer, and he says this, that when you've got a smartphone with a camera, everything looks like a status update. 
one of the challenges of living in a digital age is how technology can divide our lives into the digital me and the real me. And sometimes those identities are not the same, that our online identity becomes separate from our actual identity, and it can often not reflect the identity that Christ gives us. And I think this can play out in two different ways. In one way, we're tempted to build an identity that looks perfect, where we share only the good things, where our kids look perfect and our families look perfect and things are going great and we curate this image of this life that we wish was as perfect as it looked online. The other identity that I think happens is that we know that when we're engaging here in real life, that we are gonna be generous with each other, we're gonna be kind with each other, we're gonna have good discourse, we're gonna treat people with respect. But when I get online and I get behind sort of a veil of what I think is protection, then sometimes when I interact online, you can be mean-spirited, you can be a bully, you can be judgmental, you can say things to people online that you would never say to them to their face in real life. And so what happens with that is there are things lurking in your heart and that digital version of you is actually the real version of you. You just feel as if you have permission to say those things because it's online and it doesn't feel as real. And I think deep down, we all have a need or a sense for status and belonging. We all wanna have identity and purpose. And if our digital environments are our primary source of identity and community, then we've been shaped more by technology than we've been shaped by God. So if you think about the time that you spend online versus the time that you spend with God or with friends or with family or with community or with church, When you think about that time, where are you spending your hours and your days and your mental energy? Because the truth is we're all being formed. We're all being shaped by something. So the question is, are we being shaped by God into the character and the image of Jesus through the renewing of our mind, reordering of our love and the redirecting of our lives? Or are we being shaped and formed by the influence of technology on our worldview and our identities? Technology has the ability to shape us, so be aware of the ways that it can do that. And I think the second principle is how we understand how technology shapes us, that we practice this. And the second principle is regularly evaluate your relationship with technology. There's this interesting passage that's found in 2 John. The apostle John is writing a letter and he says in 2 John chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I have much to write, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. In today's world, it is hard to imagine a time when writing was thought of as technology. But 200 years before John wrote these letters, the philosopher Socrates was warning about the dangers of this technology called writing. Socrates believed that the only way to learn was through dialogue, and he feared that if people learned through reading and writing, then they wouldn't become wise, and he was so adamant that of the dangers of writing that he actually didn't write down any of his own ideas. And so when John is in this letter, when this verse, he is uh, giving us sort of a model that we can use when we're considering technology. He says there's some things that he would rather write, use technology, and there's some things that he would rather do face to face. He isn't critical of writing and saying never use it, only be face to face. Instead, he's saying discern when it should be used and how it should be used. I think there is a tendency to blame technology for the world's problems. We are quick to blame technology for all our distracted lives, for our constant connectivity, for our addictive behaviors towards screens, but that's really using devices as a scapegoat. 
Because the problem is not the device. The problem is our relationship with the device. And so we must always be honestly and authentically searching our hearts and evaluating if our relationship with technology is healthy. And if we are using technology in a way that is intersecting our faith in technology. So here's what I want to leave you with today. I have three verses and three questions for you to be able to evaluate your relationship with technology. The first is this. Galatians 5.22 reminds us the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Through your use of your technology, have you become more filled with the fruit of the Spirit? Does it leave you feeling joyful and patient and kind and gentle and peaceful? Or when you use technology and engage, are you feeling more filled with anxiety, jealousy, anger, hurt, or pride? Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke in the parable of the rich fool, then he said to them, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Are you constantly looking towards the next must-have technology, always upgrading, always purchasing, always looking for the latest and greatest thing, putting your energy and resources towards it rather than cultivating contentment with what you already have? The author of Hebrews reminds us in chapter four, verses nine and 10, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. This one's hard for me. Can you take regular Sabbath breaks where you are disconnected from technology, where you are disconnected from your screens and from your devices and can you take Sabbath from technology like emails, calls, and texts? Technology is a mainstay of our life and it's only gonna grow increasingly so. So we have a choice to make. We can either go with the flow, we can assimilate with culture, we can use technology without much thought, or we can be intentional about evaluating our use of technology how it affects us, what's healthy for us, so that we can have an intersection of faith and technology. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you that you are a creative God, that you spoke this world into being. God, that you created with just your words, and that one of those gifts that you have given us is the ability to create, to design, God, we thank you for the technologies that have made our life better. God, that have extended our lives, that have brought about healing, that have brought the gospel to places that it has never been. But God, we recognize that, that there is a way that technology has been used and is being used that is damaging and hurtful and dark and evil. And so together today, we pray against the use of that technology. We pray for the people who are on the front lines, God, fighting that good fight. God, we pray that your spirit would be present, that you would push, push against the dark forces, God, and that you would overcome. And God, we pray for our own relationship with technology. We confess of the ways that we are narrow in our viewpoint at times. God, that we are unwilling to engage in a empathetic, understanding and grace-filled way someone else's beliefs or their opinions or their arguments or even the things that they are saying online. God, that we would just be people who are filled with grace and generosity towards others. We confess of the ways that we find our identity in places other than you. God, I ask that you call us back to the identity that you have given us, that you have created us, you have wonderfully made us, and we are valued, treasured, loved, God, not because of any image that we have to create for ourselves, but simply because of what you did for us on the cross. God, we thank you. We ask that over this Thanksgiving break that we find moments, we find time where we can just disconnect, where we can pull away from our screens and pull away from our devices and be with friends or be with family or just be alone with you, God, in uninterrupted time. God, we thank you. We praise you today in Jesus' name, amen.